Welcome to Reader Syndicate 3.0, the next evolution of the look into counterculture that is canon. My name is Matthew, owner of Riot Seeds, and this started as a one-man mission for strain history and breeding science. Over time, it's evolved into something bigger, better, and more of a team effort. We will be joined by members of the Can Illuminati and other friends throughout the seasons to hear their takes on grow techniques, breeding science, strain history, and more. Our mission is to combat the narrative that corporate cannabis and seed posers are obfuscating for their own financial benefit. Welcome to the underground. We are the Syndicate. Welcome to Breeder Syndicate. I'm Matthew with my co-host Thousandfold. Today we're here with a very good friend of mine, Sub Rob from Seed Trip. Seed Trip Seeds. I get, we say Seed Trip Seeds? Seed Trip Seeds? Seed Trip. It's just Seed Trip. Just Seed Trip. All right, Thousand, take it away. Yeah, so the first thing I wanted to ask is actually, where does the name Sub Rob come from? <laughs> I, uh, that came from uh, around 2000, I think. Uh, I was going on a road trip. I'd settled in San Diego. I was going on a road trip. I had no idea how the internet worked at that time. Uh, and I was going on a road trip, so my girlfriend wanted me to set up uh, an email. Mm -hmm. And tried Rob, you know, a few variations of my name. And uh, then I looked down, I was eating a sub sandwich and I'm like, well, how about sub Rob? <laughs> <laughs> from the sub sandwich? Yeah, that's literally where it came from. <laughs> uh, until a few years later, when I learned how to Google and I Googled sub Rob and a whole different sub Rob came up under images. Uh, some dude in leather who was submissive. Sweet, sweet, <laughs> submissive Rob. So the first chance I got it, I changed it to Seed Trip. Yeah, yeah, I like so I like submissive Rob better though. You know yeah, <laughs> good for him, but uh, you know it just wasn't my trip. <laughs> You're the leather I daddy. <laughs> I didn't think about the submissive thing at all. I was thinking like sub Rob, like less than Rob, which I thought was really yeah. funny. Well, you know, not I quite. Was, with that idea but no it was it was literally a sub sandwich submarina in specific for those oh shit did. that's right yeah that's good shit too that's funny dude that's hilarious Thank okay you. so go ahead thousand no i was gonna say so you're saying that was around 2000 uh were you growing then yeah, I started growing full time in the early mid '90s uh, in Portland. Uh, I had gone home for the first time to Alaska to work, and uh, I went ahead and grabbed Old Blueberry, um, the clone that had, that's been floating around Delta since the early '80s, at least. Yeah down to portland and, and started growing full-time down there so when you start you, you mentioned alaska let's start there if we can so in alaska during during your years growing up there you know you mentioned earlier that like it was more legal in alaska than it was the rest of the states what kind of stuff were you seeing when you first started smoking well nothing really had names back then at least not yeah. our circle. we had some names just to differentiate the growers like Bruce's Halloween bud, you know, Mike's, Mike's green bud, you know, yeah. shit like, but, and of course, blueberry, blueberry was the first one that ever had just a specific moniker that I came across. Yeah. And that was pretty self-evident why. I mean, it's, that was, that, that's crazy cut still going evidently. Yeah. The, is you referring to old blue? Old blue. Alaska old blue. blue. That's right. I was watching one of the one of the podcasts last year and I was in the live chat and somebody, hopefully he's watching, he or she is watching now, uh, mentioned they were from North Pole, which is right up the road by Alaska Standards Delta. Yeah. And uh, he asked where I was from when I mentioned I was from the interior and I said Delta and the first thing he did was type in a few blueberry emojis. Oh, wow. And that's 2022. The first time I smoked that cut was probably 82. So 40 years later, 
the same cut is still synonymous with my hometown. So that predates DJ Short by quite a bit. Uh, probably, but I mean, I personally have always thought, just like skunk, that you could find blueberry in I'm sure you can. Afghani seed lines. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Makes sense. It's just so cool to see something like that back then. What's that? It's so cool to know that there was something like that back then that was prevalent and called blueberry at the time because of its sense. Yeah, I mean, I was in high school. When I first scored blueberry, it was probably freshman or sophomore year. So that would have been that would have been 84 or 85. And the people I got it from talked about it like it had been around for a while. So that's wild. I don't know. Well, when did DJ start, start his blueberry line? Uh, I know he, he first started selling it in mid 90s. So selling yeah. it, but God knows what, you know, I don't know how long ago he worked it and let stuff out or clones out, but who knows on that, to be honest. Yeah. And I have no doubt. I don't remember seeing when did the seed catalog start showing up in high times? 85 was the first time. I want to say that was. I, th I want to say that was the one where um, they were putting like Afghani one, Afghani two from Sam the Skunk Band. That quick little list of Skunk one and stuff like that. I don't know where anybody would have gotten any commercial seed in the interior of Alaska in the early eighties. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. We had lots of seeds. There was yeah, a that lot makes sense. There was a lot of travelers in Alaska. The same kind of hippie expat veteran angry crazy motherfuckers who wanted to go visit afghanistan and india you know alaska was also on their itinerary you know i mean yeah. it's not a, a place a good place to go get lost not right, be found so, and yeah. there was no shortage of seeds uh when i was growing up but clones really took hold in the mid 80s yeah around where i was from especially blueberry <laughs> what when did you first see matt Nuska valley thunderfuck show up well going back to strain names nothing really had a strain name back then yeah. back then everything that came from the valley and i'm sure not just the, the valley being matt Nuska valley yeah, yeah not matt Nuska valley but probably anchorage and palmer and lost it Probably every, everything was called Matt Nuska Thunderfuck, especially during the summer uh, when tourists were around. Oh, I bet. I bet. But, other, you know, other people have commented on some of my posts and threads that they've never smoked the same Thunderfuck. Yeah. A lot have commented that they've never smoked the same Thunderfuck twice. You yeah, know? that makes sense. I wonder why it took hold, though. Any idea? Look, man. Skunk, when did skunk number one become a strain? Uh, did, 78. Okay, well, that, that nips that argument in the bud right there because I was going to say skunk was a term before skunk number one. But Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, everywhere I lived, whether it was Oregon, Alaska, California, and this is all pre-internet, everybody used the term skunk. You know, Maui yeah. Wild, there's... There's 50 different strains named Mountain. Oh, absolutely. Uh, that is the real deal MTF or the real deal Maui Wow. But once people start using the name, you know, fast forward 20 years later, who's to say what is what? You yeah, know? right. Gets lost in the mix. People didn't trade strains a lot back then. There were certain small groups that you were basically, well, in, in my situation, it was, it was who your parents knew. You know? Yeah. Now with, that's where you got to cut if you got to cut at all. So I just, I, I don't think MTF has been a strain specific name since probably the eighties. Yeah. Every grower in the Valley. And I used to go down, I lived in Anchorage for a couple of years and, which is close to the valley. And, and the friends I knew who grew down in that area were out in Matanuska Valley. Everything was Matanuska. Everything. <laughs> Marketing, I, bro. 
don't sweat it because if somebody gets a cut from Alaska that's worth, you know, making a hybrid out of or a poly hybrid out of, it's pretty good. It's probably a pretty damn good cut. Yeah. I never had bad weed until I got to Humboldt for college. <laughs> You leave it to California to leave that impression, right? Now, I also had some of the motherfucking best pot I'd ever smoked in my life in sure. Humboldt, but I'd never had bad weed in Alaska. Did, did a lot of Mexican brickweed make it up to Alaska, too? Wow. I didn't experience that till I moved to... I might have seen some in Humboldt, mm -hmm. but when I moved to New Mexico, it was my first real experience with Mexican brick wheat. So that's not even that long ago, right? Yeah, I take it back. I've got someone when we were I used to spend the summers in California. Yeah. Um my parents were from Humboldt and one of their parents my paternal grandparents moved from McKinleyville to uh San to the Bay Area because he worked yeah. for uh, so I used to score weed with my friend Matt in San Francisco, and yeah, I, I remember getting brick weed then too. So in my teens, were your parents growers, or were they into that scene at all, smoking at least? Well, my dad uh, smoked whenever his friends came over, or he went over there, or they were working, or there, there's a lot of partying in Alaska. You know, there's yeah, I imagine so. Yeah, uh, and they also take work very serious because a lot of the work you can only get done during the summer. So the summers uh, with all of our parents were a matter of working 16 to 18 hours a day. Jesus. So turn a block when you snatched a few joints from their stash. Yeah, Just, right. You know? Yeah. So you got a thousand what questions you want to get in. I was actually more curious about um what life was like for you back then and like how you you know how you gravitated towards the plant and all of that um well it was uh i'll tell you what really got me into weed the first the first stuff i got into i think my first true love in the drug category was probably lsd i loved acid as far back as you know i i trip the first i started i don't know fifth grade sixth grade <laughs> you know by sixth grade i had enough trip <laughs> what i was doing and i also grew up grew up in an environment where where we didn't have tv we didn't have electricity for for a lot a lot of it so i read a lot and my dad had a lot of counterculture books so i really got into everything from the we were the whacked out hippies on the bus that began the whole hippie movement to the Grateful Dead to Merry Pranksters, the you know, and so there was a lot of mention of cannabis. But for the most part, I viewed pot as something to come down off of LSD or mushrooms, yeah, or cocaine or all those all that speed we had in the eighties, black beauties, you know, yeah, yeah right. Whatever we used to get through the school day. Um, and that's what it was for. Uh, it didn't really become something I was really passionate about until I was in either sophomore year or junior year of high school. I was assigned to write a story uh, about the war on drugs. And cause remember this, mid 80s yeah couldn't escape the war on drugs propaganda and i got i got assigned to write a paper i don't know if it was journalism or if it was just some sort of writing class on the war on drugs specifically cannabis yeah and what i used to do for my schoolwork is in the library we had these they were like encyclopedias i think they were called the sirs issues s-i-r-s Okay. Uh, something along those lines. And, and basically, what is they would address the subject and they would present pro con, pro side, and a con side. And they would back up each side with all the evidence that they could find 
while they were assembling the encyclopedia. And uh, so I went and I started reading. You know, you start with the discovery of Delta THC 9, whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, in Israel at a university. And then I read all the, the pro sides. And then I read the, the con sides for legalization of cannabis. And uh, that's where I learned about the DEA schedule, you know, schedule one through four. And within 20 minutes, within a half an hour, a 15-year-old kid in the mid-80s, you know, no internet, no outside interviews, just two books, figured out that cannabis being illegal was was bullshit. Yeah. To be a Schedule One narcotic, you must have no medicinal uses. Well, the guy who discovered and labeled Delta 9 THC also noted, like the first experiment he did was on, uh, what was it, cataracts? Yeah, glaucoma or something like that? Yeah, swelling of the optic nerve and how cannabis had the medicinal effect yeah. of shrinking back down not to mention all the bro science from all the hippies that you know were still in their 30s at the time yeah and it was really shocking to me that was my first real moment of wow the government is pulling one over on us and that it led to you know the the industry behind the war on drugs you know in hindsight it's tough to remember when i discovered what phase of the the industry of the war on cannabis and who was making money off of it and where and how much privatized you know prison industry and on and on and on but as hard as it is now in hindsight to remember the exact timeline of discovering those things i'll never forget that day in the library when i was 14 or 15 going wait a minute this does not add up and at that point that's when you know a a cannabis activist was born in me yeah it, no makes sense it had always been something that you know our parents and our parents friends and our teachers and our future teachers and that was something for them that was old man shit. give me a couple squares of acid a 40 of malt liquor right reds and a joint for tomorrow morning, and I was good, you know. Yeah, <laughs> I, had, I, you know, I, had, I feel uh, free to put stories down. I mean, I tend to ramble, especially when I'm this high. Oh uh, no, that's good. No, that's that. I had a similar experience uh, growing up. Like, weed was always around, but it was always like it wasn't a drug to us. Like we were into drugs, and that was like okay, yeah, we'll smoke weed, but it was to you know come down off this or in the meantime of getting this or that, it was always just kind of there. And it took a long time for me to find the same passion that I have now. It's similar to your story. Yeah. I, I probably a lot of people, you know, yeah. probably people came into it. Now, once that happened and once I got a little older and started meeting the actual growers instead of their kids, you know, and, talking about cannabis while we sat around smoking it got more interesting and more interesting and then as i was introduced to more strains uh, that that really piqued me but even when i started in the mid 90s when i started growing just full on full time it was, we had one strain and that was blueberry that was it we didn't give it to anybody you know uh our closest friends the first couple of years had no idea we were the ones who were growing this killer weed yeah I had smoke all the time. <laughs> it was so blue i matt i know you're a strain nut. It, this is how blue old blue is from 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 delta uh, a lot of people would travel together during the winter a lot of us would work up there seasonally you know firefighting uh working out in the woods with geologists exploratory geologists looking at gold mines shit like that and then go wherever we wanted in the winter some of them would go snowboarding you know in utah or wherever um 
And so this one winter, three people from Delta came with me down to Portland to where I had my established circle of friends. And one of them was the guy who gave me the blueberry cut. His stepdad was the guy who gave me the blueberry cut. So Bill knew that I had spent the previous winter growing blueberry in Portland. Went back home, worked. Billy came with us. Uh, and, and my partners already had the blueberry going when we got back. So the first thing we did when I got there, uh, we had to fix the ventilation on the roof. And I said, Bill, come on up with me. I just got to fix the ventilation for the grow room. Yeah. And we go, we, we smoked a joint of blueberry, climbed up the ladder, went, started fixing the ventilation from our flower chamber. And Billy looks around and goes, ooh, one of your neighbors is baking blueberry muffins. <laughs> How high are you? You know? Yeah. But it, it was crazy. It, it's I've seen so many blues, DJs. You know, I've seen so many blues from them, and none of them are close to what that blueberry was, which yeah. is what every old dude says about every old strain, you know? Yeah, dude. But absolutely true. Nothing. Yeah. People, every place that clone has been, people still tell stories about that blueberry. There was a clone that floated around uh, Oregon as well. I don't, I, don't, I don't, it's old, and it's also called Old Blue. And it's also maybe not connected to DJ Short as well? You know, it could be. It could be. Things did not end well in Portland for a group of us. Because mm -hmm. there was other drugs still involved back oh, then. Oh, sure. Um, and it's possible the one guy besides me who had access to it could have let it go. I mean, yeah. to this day, he's still on the needle. So he hasn't, so I, I got to judge his trustworthiness. Yeah, for sure. You know, so I don't know. It, it's very possible, but uh, there was, there was a couple blueberries in Oregon at the same time. Yeah. That makes sense. So, Bunch of hippies. Yeah. And, and I had no idea if it had survived or not until this past year when, uh, my sister got a hold of my childhood best friend, his mother, on Facebook, and they put the two of us in touch. And uh, I sent him a picture of my flower room, and he immediately sent back a picture of his. Uh, and it was just Captain Old Blue. And I'm like, you're shitting me, dude. That's blue. Still growing it? And he still got it, yeah. Get that still down this way. I want to see it. I want to see it. That was my immediate plan. Um, right now, I'm fucking around with those seeds I made and that guy from Wales sent back to me. Uh, the oh, yeah, yeah. That blueberry. Once I get those out of the way, I got to get an OG out here in New Mexico, man. It's killing me. It is yeah, we killing can do me. that. That's easy enough. Yeah, well, I, I've, I've got it in the works right now. I, I got to get it done before summertime. Cause summer here, you can't ship out here yeah it's the same here it's the same like nightmarishly hot nothing lives in mail yeah um so you know i'll, I'll probably talk to him we, we he said he's willing to to send it down so we'll see I, I had some hesitancy at first it's like uh you know sometimes what's hall of fame in your mind yeah it's exactly over the years and i'm old enough to know that sometimes you just leave that alone yeah but then your show last year when that when that viewer from north pole started typing in blueberries i was like shit if, if my hometown is still known for blueberry pot then yeah i'm pretty sure it'll hold up just fine yeah that's, that's pretty cool that's pretty cool I, I i love all blueberries even though i feel like i've got the best I still want all of them. I need to experience all of them when I hear about, especially the older ones that may not even be related or tangentially related or whatever to DJ's lines. You know, I'll say this about DJ's lines. Every blue smell I ever smelled from them wasn't really blue. Now that's not a giant pool of DJ shorts, blueberry that I'm drawing from. Sure, that's sure. I don't know how many samples from how many growers I grew his stuff once. It was actually a cross. It was uh, it was Doctor Atomic from Canada. yeah 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 yeah. I 
EJ shorts blue and somebody's probably Sensi's NL5. Yep. And it actually was not a bad cross. I, I remember those scenes pretty fondly, actually. There were some good blues that circulated Canada. There really were um, different selections done with DJ stuff, bigger selections done in Canada by different dudes up there. And, and they did pull out some really good blues, but they were, they were few and far between and, and hard to get down here. They, uh, they were, they always seemed more fond of the, the fruit terpenes in Canada, you know, yeah. even before the forums, you could tell the Canadian seed companies, they were all selling berries of various types. Yep. Yeah. So, what was your first forum experience? Where did you first come into the forums? And because I, I know you're you're um, technically re te technologically retarded in some aspects, how did you end well, up on the forum so early? Uh, it was that that same time period that I did the uh, the sub rob at Hotmail or whatever it was. Yeah. When I came up with that, it was it was on that computer. It was really the first time I'd been on a computer. They'd been out, but I just I, I was busy. You yeah. Know. Uh, I started looking for pot, and the first two things I found were who was who was it who had marijuana back in the day? Motor Rebel and um, Woodhorse and Chris Wood Horse. Yeah, Wood. I found that was like the first pot anything on the internet i ever found i'm like holy shit this guy's selling seeds yeah and then i overgrow right after that yeah so what was now, your experience like there i never heard there was a point where i did register there was i, I was super paranoid still back then sure um there was a time period when you didn't have to be registered to view everything on Overgrow. And at some point they made an upgrade where it was only limited access. Mm -hmm. So people all registered as like unregistered 1701. Yeah, 17. Yeah. I was one of those unregistered guys for a little. <laughs> um, but uh, then around... When did I sign up at IC Mag? When did IC Mag start? That was in the 2000s, right? 2007, 2006. I, was, there, right? oh, I think it started in 2002 or 2003. Even earlier? Yeah. I registered in 2006. Okay. Something like that. And that was that was the coolest cannabis experience I ever had. Outside of the actual growing and smoking, yeah, for know. sure. But that was, you know, high times may be a joke now, but back then, high times was pretty much my only source of information sure. in, for a decade and a half. Shit, I mean, I think you look back some of those old high times, you know, that magazine was not only respectable, as far as I'm concerned, they had Pulitzer worthy content back then that would have never been considered oh yeah but when you, the qualifications for what it takes to you know to qualify for awards like that they had it they yeah, had I it agree. all i agree Great. early high times was amazing some of the best even some of the best strain reviews you could ever find you know back from our are the connoisseur they had cool punk rock stuff too like they were very punk rock oriented in the 70s which i thought was interesting and metal and metal, yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't just the dead, you know. It wasn't just Led Zeppelin, the dead, and the doors, bro. It was, it was all, all inclusive. Yeah, I, uh, I enjoyed. It. I mean, that was like what I looked forward to most each month was High Times Mag coming yeah. out. You know, and you, you catch your dad playing through it and reading it, and it, it was just, uh, it, it really conveyed that '60s and '70s outlaw culture not just hippie culture oh yeah the for sure the... all the cocaine ads and shit bro <laughs> yeah. all, all the cocaine ads all over the place in the old high times oh, yeah and uh, i mean they were writing about ricky ross before ricky ross got oh, yeah. busted yeah I mean, they were writing about the whole conspiracy of behind 
around Ricky Ross before before anybody else was. They, they were yeah. a good man. So yeah, that was. I don't know. How, um, were you concerned about your, you know, personal safety at all in this time? Like, how did it feel to you? I'm sure it both felt like it must have felt empowering, but also like, you know, were you scared? When I got on IC, when I really started going at it yeah. in the forum? No. Yeah. At that point, I was by Prop 215, you know, and I didn't give a shit. It's like, come, come find me. You're, you're seeing everything I'm doing. Yeah. You know, pictures up every day. So if you think you're going to come find a warehouse behind me, no, I like my job too much. You know, yeah, here's, right. here's my tents, you know. So I, I wasn't worried at that point at all. I was like, come get it. I, in, in California, I understood exactly where somebody with 25 or 30 flowering plants ranked uh, on the list of shit that the locals or feds needed to get done and get busted. Yeah. In, in the early 2000s in California, if you were going growing 25 plants, nobody gave a shit. Exactly. That's how I feel or, too. So at that point, my paranoia almost completely disappeared. So when does when does the sub Rob's madness cut, the San Diego madness cut float through? What year is that? I started getting that in 1999. It wasn't a big San Diego cut. One guy had it. One mm -hmm. grower. Had it. That was it. And he also bred it. It was. Uh, it was Oregon Big Bud crossed with an indica that he okay. had. Uh, I started getting it from this kid. His his girlfriend worked with mine, and uh, he came over and started selling me that. He also got Bull Rider P ninety one, Betsy, Hog's Breath. He got every cap every strain that came through. San Diego, this 16 or 17 year old kid had access to. That's awesome. And a family. Um, I never found out who it was. I never cared. You know, I wasn't trying to get a better deal. Just make sure I don't run yeah. out of weed. Um, and then I started growing again. And, and this kid would always ask me about cannabis. He, he was always interested in cannabis and cannabis history. So when the guy who was selling him madness, decided to retire and move back to humble he said i ain't taking this loan with me he was he was old he i yeah. guess he was like and uh he told he told my friend hey man you know anybody who who will take care of this clone and appreciate it and he said i got just the guy and so he gave it to me um and that's still one of my favorite cuts not the most potent yeah it was it wasn't gonna knock any of the the really well-known San Diego cuts, you know, off the top of the mountain, except for in yield. I've never had a, I've never had a cut that yielded like that thing. What was the turp profile like on it? Like the scent profile? It was uh, leathery. It was, it was in that leathery mm -hmm. cat, you know, kind of suede, uh, new suede, new leather, you know, that smells. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Sweetness. Very hard to describe. Very hard. But uh, it was definitely unique. Um, tasted just like it smelled. And it had a good, solid, good, solid high. Yeah. That's interesting. Do you have any idea what it might have been crossed to? Like, with all your years of experience now, looking back? Wouldn't have a guess. I've had other, I've had other strains that that fit into that leathery, leather, tennis ball suede. Yeah. I think uh, the perfect pearl cross that you sent me. Oh, yeah, I yeah, think yeah. I do that a little bit. Uh, but it's not a profile that that you see a lot. You yeah. Know? Definitely not but nowadays. It had like a, a like an aftertaste, too, which is always good with cannabis strain. It had oh, yeah. uh not the taste, but you know how Schramm immediately evokes Nag Champa. Oh, yeah. That Nag Champa. This invoked the texture of cologne to me. Interesting. 
be necessarily not not necess- uh, a specific scent, but just the after effects of cologne. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Was- shouldn't have much ash. Oh, you're doing fine. No, this is good. Um, this is great. When did you first run into? Let's let's go through a little list. Uh, P ninety one. Your experience. Well, I moved to San Diego. Moved permanently to San Diego in ninety nine. Okay. So it was everywhere. Yeah. It was everywhere I happened to stumble into. I should say. Most of my friends in San Diego that I had made prior to moving there permanently weren't weren't really smokers. They were all drinking. Um, But it it isn't hard if you're out drinking to meet somebody in Ocean Beach. Oh, for sure. And once they get you a sack of P91, you don't lose that number. (laughs) Yeah, no, right? No the relationship yeah so how about hog's breath same thing man i i got that kid that kid who basically became my pot dealer uh he he had access to everything pretty much as soon as i met him that was let's see that was jennifer so uh yeah so like 2000 yeah you know, I mean, he just started bring, every week. He'd bring me a selection, That's and, wild. Pick, and and you know, we didn't. Not everybody had the frame of reference of strain names back then. Sure. Uh, so it wasn't. You know, your dealer didn't show up. So oh, I got P ninety one. Yeah. He showed sure. up. Killer green bud right here. And yeah. So I think ninety one. You know. Um, so I don't know which was first, but I remember they all came from that one guy and, and he was only dealing for a couple of years once I met him before he moved on to more lucrative things. Yeah. So yeah, so I think that my experience with all those San Diego strings pretty much started almost immediately. That's pretty cool. So I know I know we've moved on from the P91, but I did want to ask because it's it's a name and it's a cut that still floats around in the group. Um, and I'd like to know, like, your impressions of it from back then. You know, how would you have described it? Well, it's the S1 that's still floating yeah, yeah, around. Yeah, it's just the S1, yeah. This Sorry, one. that's it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, you know, it was, I did a small experiment. I, I, I don't remember when I got the cut. It had to be probably, I don't know, 2003 or so. Yeah. Uh, I got the cut and I noticed something, a specific effect that I got when, when I smoked it. So what I did was I had a few guys that I shared with that I hooked up and two or three in particular who did not know each other. Uh, you know, I, I gave them each a sack yeah. and, and I asked them for feedback. I'm like anything specific, no matter how weird or how corny or how important, unimportant you might think it is. I just want to hear it. And they yeah. again, they were separate. And all three of them came back to me with the same exact thing that I had noticed, and that was when I smoked P91, I slept better than any other time in my life, and I had the most intense dreams. Well, when that's I interesting. Smoke- and I and I hadn't even so much as hinted to any of the. Th- Actually, I think it was two guys. Uh, I, I had never said a word about it. It was what do they call it? A blind test. Yeah. Double. Yep. And they both came back, and the only thing they had to say about it was the sleep effects, the dream effects, and uh, as far as other thoughts. So that's the first thing that always comes to mind when I pick P ninety one. Yeah. Taste to me, I remember the taste. I remember the feel of the flowers. Mm-hmm. Everything mind the term oily to me. Yeah. Very oily. Now that's not always a good, you know, that's not always a good quality, whether it be from a hash making perspective to sometimes some of the strains I've tried that were oily on the flowers like that weren't that great, 
or were more CBD than they were THC. Sure. But 91's case, nah, it was everything was good. I've heard uh, peanut oil or just yeah. straight associated yeah. with, with one too. But uh, I'd say oily and good bedtime meds, man. Yeah, it's strong shit. Even the S1 kept that that potency where like people compare it to ChemD type potency, stuff like that. I'm a big fan of S1s. And that that P91 S1 that who is it? Bitter. Who has it? Bitter. Bitter. Yeah. Insane when he posts it or anybody who's yeah. drawing it. Yeah, that's a sick one. But yeah, I'd say yeah, that's close. One was up I was there. gonna ask if yeah, exactly whether you'd whether you'd um actually gotten to try the the S1 that floats around or if it's just something that you've seen from a distance. I haven't yet. I think that kind of popped up in San Diego after I'd already left. I've been out here a few years yeah. now. Yeah. Were you were you one of the people I think no, I think it was Grotech and someone else when someone claimed to have the original P91 and had a bunch of people show up to a collective and they're like, sorry, bro. Sorry, bro. And he got all mad at everyone. That wasn't Grotech. I don't think that was Grotech. That might have been someone else. Some well, so it wasn't Grotech that popped up with a cut. Grotech was one of the people I think that went. Bitter went, a few other people. I had to inform the dude he didn't have what he thought he oh, had. So you're talking relatively recent. Yeah, yeah, in the past few years. Hmm. I think that must have happened again after after I left. So yeah, it's about few. two or three years. Two or three years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I I'm still in touch with all those guys. We're on group threads and stuff like that, but I don't I don't really know anything. About that. Let's talk about how you met some of those dudes on on uh, San Diego's finest cuts. Like that's probably when I think of like the most uh, seminal, influential uh, threads throughout all of IC Mag. That of course that one jumps out to me because I was in San Diego for a long time and and I was kind of partial to that and, the, and some of the guys. But for you, like how did you all kind of form into a, a crew of sorts? Uh, yeah. <laughs> It uh, it started with uh, a guy. What was Arts Dragor or something like that? D R A G O R Dragor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he and I were talking about it, and we said, we, uh, "Ape, you know, ape." Oh yeah, yeah. Gail, propagation expert, had just you know started moving clones, selling clones, yeah. and we had got I'd gotten some. Some other people that I just talked to through DM through DMs had gotten some, uh, and we were and me and and Dragor started talking about. It. I said, "Hey, let's start a thread on on IC Mag that specifically just, this guy's hooking us up, man." By that time, we'd flowered. We'd been through a couple flower cycles with his cuts, and they were yeah. they were insane. It was some of the they best legit, pop. dude. Yeah. So we said, "Let's start a thread." Um, showcasing everything that he's got and we'll advertise for him um even though it's just california you know at least yeah, people yeah. will and uh it the thread started going uh the same people started showing up every day and at some point you know i used to i used to get every ufc that came on yeah house and i had at the time what was big screen tv <laughs> you know like <laughs> yeah yeah lcd led and so i invited some guys over for and my buddy who owned uh submarina uh brought us a big six foot sub uh for everybody to just chow down on uh and we started getting together to watch every ufc fight and sample each other's wares which, you know, started the network, uh, you know, well, you grow this, you flower this. Yeah. And we'll, I'll flower this so that, you know, you didn't have to flower. Remember, I'd never had access to cuts like, like this before. This is 2003, 2004. Yeah. Or, or no, maybe, no, probably a little later than that because we were already on IC Mag. So let's call it 06. Yeah. You know, I was still popping seeds in San Diego and growing until I got the madness cut. Uh, and then I met Ape and 
bit the bullet and said, fuck it. I'm going to trust this dude. I'm going to buy cuts from somebody I, I'm not related to. Yeah. Um, and I was blown away. I mean, I had, I had a, at the time, four by four flower tent and I had probably 35 moms. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. One cut robbed, a 35 cut robbed. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's how it started. And then once you're sharing information like that anonymously, you know, you just start get, going to the get togethers at Rob's, watch the fights. And let me tell you, everybody was always trying to outdo everybody in the early times. We'd have the get togethers. And even Gypsy warned us because we talked about it. He's like, hey man, have your get togethers, but you got to be careful. You know, law enforcement is probably you know, looking at the shit that leftover paranoia from anybody oh, yeah. over 30 at the time. And we're like, Prop 15, Prop 215, go fuck yourself. Yeah, we suck it. We're done with that shit. Yeah. And, uh, and that's how, that's how it started, man. And, and so everybody would come over to my house and everybody would bring like an ounce of flour, big chunks of hash bubble hash you know edibles yeah. and everybody would leave after like four hours and i would stumble down into my kitchen the next morning and on the dining room table is like you know five grand worth of weed thousand <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. edibles i'm like what the fuck and it happened every time and the group was slowly growing and i would tell people hey if you see it on this table, take it on your way out. You know, yeah, yeah. don't be with a lot of weed, but everybody was still polite and getting to know each other. So I ended up with so much more than I could ever smoke. <laughs> so many strings so fast through that group. And that yeah. that's true too. I mean, we're all still friends. Yeah. You know, nobody in that group ever got busted. Nobody, you know, no rat, no one ever ratted. That's good. Uh, people are still in touch. People have made it in legal weed. Others have made it in black market. Both, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Some of the people who were part of that, you know, that original group, KRD, uh, he's killing it as he always has. Uh, Sean Con, Colin yeah. Grace Macaulay. Colin. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it turned out to be a really great group of growers and always learning, man. You went on that thread back in the day and you started spouting some bullshit, you get verbally slapped down by everybody in that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We did ourselves. We go at each other. You know who started that actually was uh, Shit, well, Big, big herb tree. Do you remember him? No. What was his name? Big herb tree. Big herb tree. Nah. Uh, he's the one who started us on that path of of brutal honesty and criticism, and that's one of the yeah. things. You know. Yeah. But we all, at least I learned. I learned so much. Being on that thread. You know what's funny is I didn't really realize how how influential Ape was in the in the thread. I knew he was you know part of it. I didn't realize how influential he was in that group because it's funny because like he had, he was influential on me as well. Like he really really hooked me up early on with clones. That you know like I I didn't understand how how deep of access I was given immediately as I got into San Diego. And it was just drastically different than any other city I've been to like that. It was just like, bam, bam, everything's legit from the get-go. It was, it was it was lucky. Lucky stuff. Well, well, Swerve would come down there, too. To <laughs> yeah. the That's right. Yeah, they were partners, weren't they? <laughs> Probably at some yeah, point or another. They were. Uh, all the shit that guy gets, you know what? I The only thing I have, the only dealings I ever had was getting Swerve cuts. And again, yeah. from what came from to where I ended up in SoCal in the early 2000s with clone trader. Uh, dude's okay in my book, man. Oh, you man. Know? Yeah. He's something else to me. <laughs> I have my I have my different experiences. But yeah. 
Yeah, see, I've never had I've never had a bad experience. But I mean, he's not even that good of a kisser, bro. <laughs> I do remember the episode with uh, with the pictures of his plants in high times. Yeah, that was, yeah. You know, but yeah, man, I love those clone vendors. Wick Wick six fifty. Yeah, Wick six fifty. He was a part of Cali er, Cali Connection too, I think, or he was involved with uh, getting sort of his early cuts. Yeah. Yeah, and those guys were all involved with each other at some point. Yeah, I yeah. Mean, it was just like uh, just like us splitting up, you know, flowering duties for new clones amongst the San Diego finest guys. I'm sure those guys were like, "Hey, man, if you'll take OG, you know, over to San Bernardino for me, I'll drop GDP off in the bay for you." You yeah. know, yeah. I'm sure there, there were things like so. I just looked at the thread in it. The first one is 2008. Um, I also oh, thought was... that I could ask you about yeah. some of the other cuts that were around. Um, Sour Dub? Sour Dub is my favorite plant of all time. Yeah, that's a damn good cut, dude. A uh, matter of fact, I've got it coming back with the OG that I've got coming. I've got, uh, got OG. I've got, you know what? I don't even give a shit what what label comes with an OG. But I'm anyway. I, I'm wandering off your path again, thousand. So sour double, yes. Uh, <laughs> the taste incredible. Uh, one a very fast plant to grow. The only plant that I take early, like I take everything till it's done. I let it finish. Mm -hmm. It's rare you think it doesn't go 70 days. And sour double is not done at 62, 63 days, but that's as far as I take her because the, the, the terpenes start going like this. Like, yeah. Uh, still great when you take 70 when it's finished, but you don't get any higher. The, the depth of the high doesn't mm -hmm. change any in two weeks or like the last two weeks or less. It's a great breeding strain, remind too. Me, yeah, remind me what its lineage is, guys. Who was, was Sour Dub? Sour Dub was a, a sour bubble from Bog crossed to, and there's some debate um, on whether it was NYCD. I don't think it was NYCD because it has a lot of sour diesel type notes in it. So I'm pretty sure it was Res Dog Sour Diesel IBL. Pretty sure. Well, but, that's why uh, there's confusion because Res Rat had them both. Yes, that's right. And I'll tell you, I've gone back and forth, and so is Gray School, and so is Sean Cron, so is everybody who's been growing her, you know, on and off since she came to be. Yeah. Uh, you know, there are times when you really got her dialed in that a that a sour grapefruit, like red grapefruit smell, is in there. Yeah. And Grown NYCD, that's one of the things she was known for. No, Absolutely. But red grapefruit. And I've smelled it. But on the other hand, the sour that you smell is so traditionally, and, and I heard there's no sour diesel in NYCD. There's not, no. Okay, so there's not. But in Sour Double, there is a sour, no doubt about it, that goes back to to being from that original sour diesel gene pool. I agree. Yeah, I mean, I've got it to go super skunky. Um, I don't really hear people talk about that much with it, but I've got it to go super, super skunky to where it was just like right in that skunky zone with sour in that, you know, in the sour dub. It was gnarly. It was gnarly. Yeah, sour dub is is a great plant. The official story, there's, there's lots of variations out there. The story is Bog gave a handful of seeds at a NorCal music festival at some point to a to a gangster to to a, to a, to a gang member. Uh, he did yeah. not know that it was some big dude at a <laughs> at a music fest, and Bog was feeling it, and he yeah, said, right? "It'll be the best pot you've ever smoked." The dude grew it; it became a staple of that crew. Uh, 
our boy Gray Skull knew one of the guys in that crew, and he gave it to Gray Skull and said, "Hey, man, you got to change the name. Uh, nobody can know that you have this plant." Yeah. Plant, like hash plant, but cash, because yeah. they were just serious money off of this plant. Uh, so Gray School gave it to a couple of us in, in you know, circle, uh, whoever wasn't full at the time of, of all the strains they could handle. And we started growing it. And by the first harvest, everybody was making room for it. Everybody made room for Sour Double in there. We said, we got to come up with a name if we're going to, you know, talk about this online because that's the one stipulation that, that Gray has to to stick with is not to call it cash plan. Yeah. So at one point, Bob was consulted and he said, I'd just call it double sour. And uh, I was like, that's good enough for me. Gray School said, that's good enough for me. And then one of the younger dudes who was always thinking, you know, he, he was he was probably 15 years my junior and he, he kind of knew what was coming up with Social media hadn't really started yet, but yeah. the younger, you know, let, let's put something more marketable than double sour. And he suggested sour double instead of double sour because the S came before the D. And he said it'll always be associated with San Diego now. Oh, that's smart. And we all took a vote and sour double won. So that's why it's called sour double. Yeah. That wasn't, you know, I remember when I first got the cut, I dropped it immediately without flying because I was like, oh, this sounds boring. It would just be like another sour bubble. You know, I really regretted that because I could have had it much earlier on, you know, <laughs> and ran through with it. Yeah, that was, uh, that's crazy weed. I mean, I still grow it. Yeah. I'm, oh, dude, wait to pop some of those skank dogs. We'll get into that later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's that. get into it now. Yeah. With these yeah, the crosses that you just released. Um, it was, I, I got double specifically, uh, because I wanted to reverse it specifically. I wanted to cross SSH and sour double yeah. ever since I heard about SS, S, E, H. Yeah. Yeah. Back in the forums, I just thought that would be a great merging of, of terpene, of smell, of taste. Uh, so I got the SSH back. I got the, the double back from Greg. Let's talk real I, quick. Let me cut you off. Let's talk about the SSH, the yeah. history behind it real quick. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty commonly referred to as 98 SSH now. Yeah. I think Crazy is calling another one 97. I think the SOG cut maybe. Oh, yeah, yeah. Old SOG 97, yeah. So when I'm talking about the SSH, the 98 SSH. When that cut came to me and Sean from a guy in Canada, okay. when, when he gave us the cut, among other cuts, he told us it was the one that won the cup in 98, the High Times Cannabis Cup. So, you know, that we took that at every strain this guy gave us was exactly what it was. The guy knew people, so I mm -hmm. thought there was that's what it was uh the first time i heard different was not so pointing out when he's every time he saw pictures of it and and heard it being harvested at day 65 day 70 at the latest and being done he's like you know that doesn't sound like the night or look like the 1998 cup winning cut of ssh mm -hmm. and from everything that he said, and he sent some pictures, I immediately stopped calling it the cup winning cup. Yeah. Uh, sort of crazy. I think more people know about that cut from Crazy Composer than anyone else. Yeah, he grows he, a bunch of it. Yeah. And uh, he immediately, you know, after talking to Not So, I noticed he also started calling it the 98. And I, I think that's kind of become the common moniker of that yeah. cut. So that history we got it from canada we were told it was shanti's personal cut i will say this about that cut i hit shanti up on mr nice forums mm -hmm. said hey man i just got the 98 
supposedly I just got a 98 cup winning cut from a guy in Canada. And Shanti hit me back immediately and said, well, did it come with a number? And I said, it did not. He says, if that cut is given out to anybody, the person giving it to them must give them the number, you know, whatever the number was, maybe it was trade position when Shanti was growing yeah, last, sure. you know, whatever it is, what it was, but it did not come with the number. So <clears throat> I, uh, I read the email and I said, okay, cool. You know, we'll see, we'll see what it's like. Like 15 minutes later, I got a call from the guy in Canada who said, Hey man, I just got a call from Scott or yeah, yeah. Scott. Yeah. I just got a call from Scott that I'm handing out his cut. Um, so the guy who gave it to me never retracted that it was the cup winning cut, but it, it seems to me that there was a break in the communication between Shanti and this source. Yeah, yeah. Maybe they just had them mixed up. I'll tell you this, it's an excellent cut. It is a everything that I used to read about Super Silver Haze in Mark Emery's seed catalog or since sure. catalog. It fits that description to a T. And it's fast and it's effortless. It's just it grows itself. Just give it the bare minimum of what it needs, and you're going to get a big, gorgeous plant. SSH. What do you, that what do you means, think about scent profile? What's that? What's the scent profile on that one? It's got the lemon. Uh, you know, it's got the lemon. It's got that cedar haze yeah, yeah. to me. Those would be the three things I would describe. But I've never been very good at descriptions. I've always relied on the other guys in SDF for that. Uh, but cedar, haze, lemon, I think is a, a pretty good summation. Yeah, that sounds right. I got tired of it. I don't know if it's because I grew so much of it there before I left. I mean, you walk into a room full of that stuff and it's drowning out other oh, I'm stinkers. Sure. Yeah. And it's loud. Um, it was either that or, you know, I smoked a lot of it. And most of what me and my business partner were smoking at the time was Ken and OG. Yeah. You know, so you got to be pretty stout to keep up with the Kems and the OGs. And it's, and I've never been that much of a sativa guy. Yeah. But to me, it, a, it definitely leans sativa, but the true sativa heads will tell you it's too indica. You know, it's short flowering, pretty, pretty thick flowers of good yields, um, a nice affy. A nice indica sativa mix. Yeah, like a good like a good super silver haze should be, you know, a five skunk yeah. one haze. Yeah. So yeah, so the way one of the ways we judged Bud was by how much we had to smoke to get through the Raiders game, because the <laughs> Raiders for a few seasons were pretty intolerable, and we yeah. had to smoke a lot of SSH to get through some of those Raider games. <laughs> um, so we pretty much. <laughs> You know, G for the for the bleaker of the years there. That's funny. So it, it, in summation, that's that's the cut that you used in cross to a reversed sour dub, right? Reverse the sour dub. Your juice is the shit. I'll say it. Um, awesome. I got, I got. I mean, I'm still scraping pollen off the of surfaces in there. Um, <laughs> it, it's actually, ironically, that cross is not at all what I want. I have found really? nothing that I was looking for in that cross. But what I found was if you like Super Silver Haze, which seems everybody besides me and my buddy, you know, yeah, the Super Silver Haze, then what you'll find is two-thirds of the, of the plants will be Super Silver Haze, but a little bit fatter and a little bit more body in the stone. Yeah. So it, to me, it was an improvement, but but the one that I'm really interested in is the one out of three that is, uh, I did, what I describe it as the '90s seat catalog stock photo of Hayes hybrid. Yeah. It's longer flowering, eighty to ninety days, 
big leaves, don't like small containers at all, just put them in big one. Uh, but the flowers that came from those things are pretty insane. I smoked nothing but that pheno of SSH for like four months. Yeah, I bet. You find a, a special cut, especially when you're not used to really good sativas, which I'm not, you know, physiology mm-hmm. or what, what is different. This thing blew my mind. I really enjoyed it. And when I pop more of those seeds, I'll be looking for those females. But the SSH females that came out of it are so freaking good. The hash that I made, the hash just falls off of it. Um, and that's why I sent those ones in. You know, I haven't told them in years, but after a year, year and a half, the reports I've gotten back from the other growers, it's like, okay, that's what I'm just going to sit on these seeds along with all the other ones in my freezer. So, yeah, man, uh, if you like SSH, if you are still in one of those areas where you cannot get clones, that's how I would grade these seeds is you want to try SSH for the first time. These seeds are a great way, but you're not going to find, I don't think, from all the reports I've gotten back, I don't think you're going to find any sour in SSH sour double. So if you're looking for sour, then you look at it one of the other hybrids all right let's talk about skank dog that's gonna be that that's where you're gonna find this hour all right but let's talk about the uh is it a skunk dog s1 that you used it's a skunk dog s1 uh that i kept for a few rounds um I went into this phase where I was going to take it back to the 90s European growing scene where everybody just grew from seed, didn't keep clones, just keep it moving, exploring all the time. And so I ended up getting rid of that S1. And I really wish I hadn't because that is a plant that I actually enjoyed growing more than Skunk Dog. And if, if you followed anything I've done online from the forums to Instagram, you know I love Maui Skunk Dog. I think oh, it's yeah. one of the greatest hybrids of all time. I love the the taste. It took me years before I reached that point where I, I got sick of it and stopped smoking it for a while because it's so specifically stinky. Anyway, yeah. moved to the S1. Uh, the, the word that came to mind, especially when I grew it, I grew three of them outdoors um, along with a couple of orange juice bud crosses from, from – uh, OB. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Five or six plants out there, and you could smell them for blocks here in the desert in the summer. It was crazy. I really expected the cops to show up and <laughs> new medical, you know, at yeah. the time new new recreational grower laws. Um, and I hit that with sour double, and everything that I have smelled from that has been you know, there are strains that can make your mouth water. Yeah. Um, uh, I use the term strain today after all the kerfluffle yesterday online about using strain. And oh, I like one of those. That. Uh, just somebody trying to make his bones arguing with Chimera or oh, Sun. Where was this? Instagram? What's that? Was this on Instagram? Where was this? On Instagram? Yeah, and uh, I don't even know what started it because I don't follow the dude who started it, but I, I'm pretty sure it went back to the old strand versus strain. And cultivar. You know, we know. You know, but everything I just described about the last 30 years of my growing, we didn't have medical textbooks that we were studying out of. It was 100% bro science. So I'll say strain, I'll say pheno. But, yeah, you know, all, and all the kids can kiss my ass. That's, <laughs> That's what's up. So, Skunk Dog. Yeah, what, what was in Skunk Dog? I, I can't remember off the top of my head. Skunk Dog, to the best of my knowledge, I've probably texted Sean 50 times over the years asking him. And if I finally remember right, I, I know it's a Kim D bag seed. And I think it's crossed to a skunk 
from the island of Molokai. So Molokai's okay. father, I believe, crossed with a Kim of some sort bagsy. Gotcha. Uh, the S ones that I grew, uh, including the one I kept, the Kim is obvious. I'll never question that. Yeah. It looked like Kim growing, uh, except for it kept. If you've ever grown skunk dog, it's got some really weird branching. It uh, it really goes crazy on side branch. So the the plants, and I, I think I've got some pics up on Instagram. Uh, from when I grew them outdoors, it looks like chem with the exact same branching from skunk dog. Uh, and that's that's when I first started using the descriptor skank because it just smelled skank. Yeah. And then when you hit power double, the examples I've seen and smelled so far, uh, I would say that that if if I grew some of these hybrid some of the skank dog out in 1990 every i would have sold it as skunk you okay. know i would have been called it would have been referred to as skunk by everybody who smoked it or smelled it or was in the room with somebody who had a bag of it in their pocket it is skunk is the best descriptor yeah but i couldn't call it skunk dog uh so i called it skank dog yeah i like it i like that name anyways really really brought out amplified the chem and added that sweetness to it uh i'm i'm getting ready to pop some more as soon as these dabbies are cleared i'm popping more of those i cannot wait to try some of that again i found a, a tray a trim bin with probably a half ounce You know what? I might still actually have it. <laughs> it's still over there. Uh, maybe a half ounce of seeded bud. So it was the it was the skunk dog flower with the seeds from the sour double. Pollen. Oh yeah, yeah. This was out of my tent for over a year, uncovered. Uh, <laughs> dry right now. But when I found it, and I just kind of crumpled a few seeds out of a flower, the smell hit me, and I was like. Holy shit. If I had to pick just one strain right now to pop seeds of out of everything in my collection, it would be it would be more of the skank dogs. That's awesome. That sounds really good. And we we talked about on the show um what we refer to as like the super skunk double up. Like if uh, a cam or sour, something with super skunk in it is then crossed to something else with sour or cam in it, they tend to align and make skunky fucking shit almost every single time and it's 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 gnarly it's it's and it's predictable another good example of that was uh canarado before he you know started selling seeds you know he, yeah. he was working he was doing crosses and he did a sour double reversal um, I and he and he hit i think every clone that colorado had was <laughs> he sour. sure did i think he collected everything and he wanted to send gray he wanted to send gray school uh, a 10 pack of each one of those sour double crosses to thank him for releasing uh sour double yeah so so sean told him at the time hey man i don't mess with post office but hit up rob he'll, he'll probably do it and i said hell yeah here's my address hell yeah so he doubled up every pack and sent me and grade school a pack of everything he'd done from Durban to OGs to, to all that. And yeah. I popped um, I popped either one seed or three seeds of Kim B hit with sour double, uh, reverse pollen. And there was a keeper, whether it was the one seed pop or the three seed pop, I can't remember which one, but the plan I ended up with, smelled like east coast sour diesel on steroids yeah makes sense original cut that i got back in i think 09 it it had that kind of sour diesel smell not not even a little bit watered down and i was really surprised by that smell yeah well it makes sense though yeah i remember when he did that yeah i grew those seeds for years i've never explored any gene pool uh, like I've explored the sour double gene pool, all because 
Canarado wanted to hook Grayskull up. So yeah. that was pretty cool. Yeah, he, he's a cool dude. He's always been super cool to me, too. I like him a lot. The White Sour Dub is another cut, uh, which Sean still grows in San Diego. Uh, that was the other one. One of them was a one seed pop, one was a three seed pop. Uh, and I got a keeper cut from each one of those. Uh, one was the White Sour Dub. I love that. It, it is that gives... Wubble? What's that? Is it called Wubble? Uh, the cut that I kept. We just called white sour dub. Okay. I mean, John could be calling it something else, especially with the whole with the company, maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, or maybe somebody else kept the cut too. Or maybe Canarado called it that. But uh, yeah, I don't know. That's like sour dub cream. You know? Yeah, I bet, it, dude. Smooth, smooth taste that comes around on. Did you get to grow any GG4 sour double? No. I wonder how that one would be. Probably pretty interesting. Yeah, I mean, back cross, if you get a little more sour, to me, the one thing that, that GG4 kind of lacked was, was a distinct flavor. Yeah. You know? And maybe that was a little bit jaded by the fact that Everybody who had sour double at that time was still growing sour double when, when you know Don started giving out cuts. Yeah. Of four, and it's easier to grow. It yields more than sour dub. Uh, but when you're comparing the two, I mean, I never understood why somebody would take GG four over sour dub. And I had that same point of view. Like when GG4 came out, I already had Sour Dub, so I wasn't really interested in growing GG4 the first like decade of it being out. I had no interest in it at all. It ended up being a pretty good breeder, though. On its own. In Can its you own guys life. help me out here? What's the overlap uh, in terms of their genetics? Why would you compare them? I guess as like Sour Dub's a part uh, of it. GG4 gotcha. came up, right? What's that? Didn't. Didn't G didn't grow that that's what it was, right? It was sour double hit with mystery pollen. It was like sour they said sour dub, chocolate tie, chemsis. That's right. Yeah, I don't know which one came and hit which or reversed or where they even found chemsis to hit it. It was interesting, and this brings it back to the SDF threads. It was interesting watching the beginning of uh of Grill. Gorilla Glue number four. Because on the forums, you can see the blueprint for the modern hype, hyping of a strain, marketing. Yeah. Of, the blueprint was burner online with cookies. And I remember the beginning of Gorilla Glue number four. You know, Josie wasn't, uh, he wasn't a marketing machine. He, he wasn't really caring that much. It was, it was another one or two members specifically who, who kind of talked him and it said, Hey man, you've got something here in today's legal world. You know, you don't just let something like this go for nothing. You can make money off of this. Yeah. Nothing else. And I'm pretty sure those posts would still be up on, on one of the SDF threads, probably the second one. Uh, and it was really interesting watching people make suggestions, hey, you should do this, you should do that. So it was it was kind of interesting watching the beginning of cannabis marketing from from online from cookies or and it was just a way of done. the way it was done prior to burner doing his thing with cookies. You know, the guys who'd been smoking the longest would tell the young guys, "This is what you want to smoke. This is the shit." You know, your friends would tell you, "Hey, man, I just found this. This is what you want." But that turned around with cookies. Cookies to hype came before the flower for 90% of the people who were hiding. Sure did. 
you know, you're on your second grow of all time. You're in the beginners forum and you're telling me the cookies is the best pot in the history of cannabis. You know, so I was always getting a little grouchy back then online. I talked a lot of shit. Don understood, especially with Gorilla Glue number four. Still think it's all right. But if people enjoy it, who gives a shit? Right. Like yeah. It. But I seem like I'm the only person I know who can't stand hash plant 13. Things like that. So <laughs> I do miss the back and forth. I do miss people being able to criticize each other without 130,000 people sliding into your fucking DMs telling you, you don't, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Those forum days were good. Yeah, they were. I, I tended to get banned from every forum because of my fucking mouth, but you know, it is what it is. <laughs> Editing all this to a coherent format for you. For your show yeah it'll be it'll be interesting I, hope um, so. I i also wanted to ask about the a dub and whether that has any relation or is that just a coincidence with the name that's uh a dub is sour double hit with uh alien the alien dog v2 or v1 Something that OB did with Alien Dog. Gotcha. Yeah, it's probably the V1 then if it was OBS. Or no, no. You know what? I think it was Grotech and uh, this other dude who, who came on to FTF fairly early. I'm having trouble remembering his name. And I'm kind of embarrassed about that. I think it was a project they did. And some of the people who got the seeds... Uh, KRD was one of them, and KRD found a dub, and he was just listing them. You know, there was like a dub, b dub, c dub, et cetera, and the ones that were kept were a dub, o dub, and something else. So it's sour double hit with alien dog. Yeah. Um, uh, and that's that's a very specific type plant also it's got a unique high the way i interpret it that's like uh smoking yourself into a bubble uh, you know can't tell you how many days i was working in the garden and i would smoke a dub and and i would find myself wandering like the stereotype from the 80s like what am i doing what what was i mixing you know and i yeah yeah and I, I did halfway and hadn't finished yet and something right beside it on the workbench that shit just puts you into a another state of being. That's like smoking concentrates. Like I don't buy into all the thirty percent this, twenty eight percent this, thirty percent this. But when people were first starting to get things tested, I think that was the second cut that I saw come up with a thirty percent reading. Yeah, uh, which. You know, the reason I don't put any stock into it is, you know, those are adjustable. It's all about where the machine is balanced at. Now, yeah. there are uses for it, of course, you know, especially in breeding and selecting phenotypes and stuff like that. But that's another thing I remember about A-Dub was I think that was the second time behind Bruce Banner that anybody dared to say I got 30% THC yeah. on without getting laughed at. And it's the one that made me believe, hey, I don't know if it's 30, but it's definitely oh, got it's... something something up in there. Yeah, that was a great strain. How about, okay, me and you've talked about it a bunch, but I, I don't think most people outside of a few of us really know about it. The Dabney Blue. Dabney Blue was something Sean had more experience with. Yeah. Um, but he brought over some, some of the Dabney... Afghani Kush. Yeah. Uh, the very blue. That's like, uh, that's near the uh, blue that I've smelled besides old blue from, from Alaska. That was a deep blue. Like it was, uh, it was good. And that was cross. So I don't know what the original Dabney blue was like, which is also from Oregon. Yeah. Yeah. It's from a 
But remember, I, I got a hold of the guy, or he got a hold of me somehow. Yeah, it was like mini a, a frisbee golf course name. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Never got the original back, though. Oh, wait, no, I take that back. It is in the circle. It is. I don't know if I don't know if I'm ever allowed to touch it yet. We'll see. Well, one of the crosses I made with that was uh, East Coast Sour Dab Meat. Yeah. Shot brought over some pollen. He had a male, male Dab Meat Blue Afghani Kush. He brought over some pollen, went up to my tent and hit East Coast Sour Diesel with it. And I made a bunch of those seeds. We use a lot of that pollen on the East Coast Sour Diesel. And we hit a few other things with a purple joy, which was a purple plant that was I remember that. Kind of purple plant that I dug. I mean that deep perfumey Afghan. It, it was in it was in Nepalese um Nepalese Afghani hybrid, if I remember correctly. Well that makes sense too, the the Nepalese. Yeah. Uh but it had that purple flavor that I like. I don't really go for the GDP so much, the yeah, grapes. Same. But I like those old, those old perfumey, stinky, small buds, but it don't take much. I like those purples. Yeah. So, so he brought over the pollen. Uh, the F1 seeds, I sent most of them to the server fund auction for IC yeah. Mag. Among the other other people who bought them was uh, a guy who went by Brando MK okay. and he had been head of something for prime wellness in Pennsylvania, okay. which is a league, I guess a big ass company. And he happened to take the seeds in there and pop them there. They became prime wellness property as far as he was concerned, you know, sure. as far as he could say these are my personal stash you know um but they to this day they still run two phenos that they call sweet blue uh sour blueberry oh nice they make shatter they make all the concentrates out of it i go through the uh matter of fact on their website they have it listed as sub rob's sour diesel um which it wasn't sub rob sour diesel it was <laughs> the sour diesel clone yeah but i think that you know, had marked on his packaging was sub Rob, you yeah. know, and then he sold cross with Dabney Blue. So that's what I've got going. A, a guy in Wales bought him in like 2010. He lives in Wales. So he, he told me, uh, he told me, he says, I've got tens of thousands of dollars of seeds in my deep freeze that I never got to grow. And he goes, some of them are yours. Why don't I just send them back your way? And he did. That's awesome. Uh, Got uh, six going in the in the veg tent right now in perpetuity. I cracked them like eight months ago, and I've just been recycling moms because I haven't I haven't flowered in the beer. Yeah, that's been going on for a while, bro. <laughs> oh, I got to I got to do it. I got OG and Tower Double coming, so I need to. It's real interesting when you're running literally just personal growth. Yeah, I went from having an upper limit. Now, we weren't even big. I've never, at no stage in my career, would I be considered a big time commercial grower by today's standards. Sure. At no same. Uh, I've done compares to the 100 lighters, 200 lighters, 1,000 lighters, you know. Um, but I used to have room for stashing anything I wanted, cracking seeds, and an extra tray over there in the corner. It's different when you are, when you're just running a little five by 10 by eight, 10, you know? Yeah. I was going to ask you, because obviously we have, we have lots of different clones and names that we could ask you about, but I did want to know, because you were, you know, just referring to your current situation, like, what are you working on now? And like, what, what do you think the future holds for you in terms of um, the plants? Um, right now I'm not working on anything, man. I, I, I've been smoking the SSH dub for going on a total of the last harvest of it for like six months now. I just started going over to another, 
when I moved down here to New Mexico, there's another old time IC magger that I've known forever online who lives here. And I go by and get samples from them. And uh, it's just really slowed down the flowering schedule. Plus, I kind of I, I grew a little more than I needed to. And I don't I don't I don't sell weed anymore, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, I've been the real work I've been putting in is judging that SSH dub lately. Um, but I do have plans for every three sets of plans I make. I usually carry out one. And the next thing I'm going to do is see if this East Coast sour dab me uh, is worth doing a seed increase. And see, I got uh, this goes back. Sorry, here I am derailing the conversation again. Okay. When I was when I was living in Valley Center okay. around 2013. 2015 maybe my house got burgled and yeah. i had in the freezer i had a bin with every crop i'd ever made um not to mention all my friends had ever made anything i'd ever bought traded for and in them i had a a whole bunch of those of uh, both f1 and f2 east coast sour dabbing that i had always planned uh because of the success that Prime Wellness had with 10 of those seeds. I always had plans to work that line and maybe do some real actual breeding work with it. Uh, but the thief along with a bunch of other shit got all the seeds. So I need to find out just how stiff these East Coast Sour Diesel genetics come through in these seeds and just how hardcore the the dabney kush does um and see if it's worth trying to to increase and, and do something with those thieves suck bro very cool these always fucking shit up yeah yeah like yeah i also want i want to do another sour dub reversal because i missed some plants i, I didn't I didn't get the the Chem D cut in time when I made those seeds. And going back to that that plant I got from Canarado hitting Chem D with sour dub. These are crosses. These sour dub crosses are something that I've begged my friends who make and sell seeds to do. I didn't want to do any of this stuff, man. I wanted to move <laughs> on. But the the cannabis world, the the demand in the industry seems to have moved on from some genetics prematurely yeah i'm not saying, i'm saying hey you know go get the sherbets and the biscottis and the biscuits and the, and the whatever hell else pastries are out there but don't <laughs> you know go down a little bit you know because there's a lot of the there's a lot of the cuts that came in the era of the forums that we should still be concentrating on. I mean, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't want to take the journey away from, from everybody, but at least a small percentage of people need to go back and start working with the sours and the M's and the OGs because those are gene pools. And uh, oddly Almost enough, I've talked about it. Like I have people hitting me up all the time asking for OG cuts because nobody kept them. Like not nobody, but in a lot of people, enough people dropped them that a lot of these big, you know, places that these pl people used to run, like they don't even have OGs anymore, not pure OGs. You know? And that gets us circled back to SDF, which is the the, the thread I'm supposed to be staying on. Sorry. You um, good? No, you're good. Man. We all had, at one point, not only did all the P91, Bull Rider, you know, all we all had not just one, but we all had all those cuts. Yeah. You had in your bedroom. You had P91 in your bedroom. You had Madness in your bedroom. You had Cat Piss. You had Hog's Breath. And they all up and disappeared. And, you know, blame eight. I really do. Because I wasn't the only one who had never had access to that many cuts, you know, at one time. Yeah. And I wasn't the only one who went crazy and would just get cuts from eight, 
and veg them and flower them in a tent with 14 other kinds with single plant each, you know, of 15 different cuts. Uh, and you would just, you know, move on from them and, and you wouldn't keep moms because you got another 20 from eight when yeah. you came to. And, and basically we all thought that P91 would stick around. We all oh, thought yeah. bull run around and they just up and disappeared in the matter of like a year and a half. Yeah, they did. Damn shame. We didn't know what we were. It was like being cut drunk, you yeah. know, we all just ate that shit up and, and forgot about a lot of stuff. Cycle repeats itself. That's how it goes, dude. Hmm. I always thought everything when was going to be around forever. Yeah, because maybe this is almost more for Matt, but when I look at, you know, I went through some of the threads and piled a whole list of, of clones that stood out to me. When I look at some of the names, you know, Chernobyl, Strawberry Cream, Daywrecker, it also strikes me that, of course, this is some of, these are some of the cuts that Matt worked with earlier as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's super cool to make that connection. I didn't, I didn't actually realize, I don't think. I like that Strawberry course. Cream. Yeah, yeah, you you would have run the same exact clone that I did because mine came via eight. Yeah, it was a good cut. Yeah, it was great, man. If for a strawberry, it was fucking mega strawberry. I had another one. I don't know what it was. A lot of times I would get cuts. I'm sure everybody did from eight where something went wrong and the information wasn't passed right. But I remember calling one Bob, which stood for body odor berry. And that was a <laughs> Dank ass berry cut. I'm curious what other what other cuts did you come up with from those threads? What else did you come okay, up with? Let's see. <clears throat> so we've already mentioned P91 Hogs Breath, Bull Rider. So I saw a GDP Grape A, Cat Piss, Purple Kush, Green Ice, Albert Walker, Chernobyl, uh Green Ice. Strawberry Cream we mentioned, Old Betsy, Master Kush. Day, right? green crack green crack was a big one down there so green ice was something that was around for a very short period of time that was cali green uh he had gotten some seeds from the original gg4 which was gorilla gold four yeah by Brad Brad up in canada which was an awesome strain indoor or out it was kind of on the bland side for indoor weed in so in Southern California at the time, but Cali found a male and he hit green crack along with a couple other cuts. And so that's where green ice was born. And that is a strain that still to this day, I still, whenever I talk to him, I'm like, Hey man, dude, remember green ice? Yeah. He's <laughs> probably in his, dude, I know I fucked up. I shouldn't have lost it. Uh, yeah. this is getting but uh but yeah that was i remember the flavor of that i haven't hit that since probably 2007 or 8 that was in the beginning uh and and i still remember i remember that that plant that was awesome i'll bet you not many people remember it but uh i enjoyed that very much do you remember ak48 god's gift they were slowing around yeah, I don't think I grew it, but I say that all the time, and then I go through the the forums. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I did grow that, but I remember growing AK forty seven. I remember growing cherry. I remember AK forty seven. When's the earliest that came out? Fuck, I, like, I, I don't know. Probably mid nineties. Yeah, because when I was in Portland growing uh, blueberry, there was one guy. That one of the very few guys we let in on our secret, he was a grower also, and he was growing these these newer seeds, uh, AK forty seven, and White Widow, and he had he selected cuts from both of those, and that was pretty awesome weed. I'd never really had AK forty seven that lived up to that AK forty seven that what's his name was growing in Portland back in the day. Yeah, good strength. I'm trying to think, like I've I've had a few good AK forty sevens. Um, there was like a lemon AK. There was the uh, like cedar AK. But then there's also the cherry AK that went around San Diego, and it was beautiful, frosty, 
no density to it. It was fluffy and not very potent, but it was it was really good tasting. That was about it for it. It's still floating around. Oh yeah, yeah. I'd used it in the cherry berry that I not too long mm-hmm. ago. Yeah, I say. I enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. I, I I was stoked to see it again, even though it's not super potent. Um, it is a great breeder, especially for those turps. Cherry cough drop. Yeah, now I've already, I remember a couple of the clones you listed, Thousand, uh, popped off in my mind immediately, but I've already forgotten what they were. So, um, Green, I up. think ones we haven't talked about yet, like maybe Chernobyl or Daywrecker or Albert Walker, any of those. Chernobyl was a seed line from TGA. So, there's a lot of different cuts mm-hmm. of that. Yeah. Yeah. That's correct. The Dago Walker, remember that? Walker, uh, Sean, I think Sean was the one who got that one, and yeah. it was the Albert. Uh, and Fletch, uh, I think all Fletch even needed to see was the veg picks of that plant. And he was like, hey, bro, that ain't, that's not Albert Walker. And it turned out it wasn't, of course. He was he was right on with that one. Yeah. So we called Walker, just because we were too lazy to come, we didn't know if we were going to end up keeping it. Tell you what, man, that plant is a citrus explosion. Yeah, it was a nice plant, dude. We tried taking the citrus down a notch. Uh, the first reversal I ever tried was Tahoe OG Kush. Oh, wow, a hard one. I had it in the room and I was spraying it every day, and it just wasn't going well. And yeah. so I said, Sean happened to come over one day and he got in there and he found a pinprick of pollen somewhere on that plant and he ran upstairs and he hit and he hit uh Dega Walker. Yeah. With it. I think he got three seeds. Grew all three of them out and one of them is still around. Uh, it's called Cactus Cool. Okay. Yeah, yeah cooler cut comes from and, and we always swore we were going to reverse tahoe or or one of the ogs uh and hit it again and try to bat that citrus down a little bit more <laughs> you know, very full of that in a room it's it's overwhelming it's too much like yeah. i it went citrus for me it's great how much citrus was from that one yeah, I was bummed when I found out that wasn't real Albert Walker because that was one of the ones that I fucked with too. And I was like, oh, yeah, we got the real Albert Walker. We got that down here. It turned out not to be. Yeah, I've never smoked, grown, knowingly smoked Albert Walker. And that's same. a bummer because, like you said, that's what I was wanting to try. Yeah, same. I, I've, I've never seen a real one or smoked it or wouldn't even know what it smells like. Nothing about it, really. If that one isn't it, you know, that's my only experience with it. What uh, what was your favorite San Diego cut? I was so partial to to Hog's Breath. I, yeah, yeah. I really have the question. I probably didn't need to uh, for sentimental, if nothing else, you know. And the clockwork one that came from uh, Doug, this dude, crazy Doug down there. Doug knew everyone. He was the one who hooked me up with James in the first place, um, and the whole Hog's Breath crew. But he had, you know, like there's an Apollo 13 cut he had down there that was really good. Uh, he gave me Fire OG really early on. He gave me Chem D really early on. So, like, yeah, he was, that dude was connected to everyone. Sorry, guys. Just wanted to ask here, and Matt, maybe this is obvious, but I, I'm just, like, it's not clear to me. But, uh, what's the overlap between the Hog's Breath crew and San Diego's Finest um, in terms of people? Were there lots of crossovers or...? Not really. It was just family. Like the the Hodgebeth family was there. They ran Unified Collective in San Diego, and you know people that you could go in there and talk to him anytime. The dude who who yeah. So it was just like local groups, basically. Local local different groups, and Hodgebeth was just that well known in San Diego that everybody knew it. It was it was the staple. Um, Do we want to talk about the bull rider? Are we? Is everyone sick of? Like, I, I, I feel like we bring it up once in a while. I don't know anything about Bull Rider myself because I only ever had a fake Bull Rider. Uh, bull Rider probably overall is was probably my favorite of the San Diego cut. Yeah, I love I love the smell. The smell and the taste was just you know I barely even remembered if I'm being honest, but I remember you know 
when I first got here, I had just come off smoking blueberry for four years. Yeah. Straight. It was, had become a big thing for me. Uh, and I thought I was a snob, you know, <laughs> thought I knew what I was doing. Uh, and Bull Rider was the one that took the place of the Blue Rider for me because it gave me all the flavor that I could want from from a dank, sour but not sour diesel perspective. It was yeah. it was really dark, dank weed to me. And did I old Betsy it. did old Betsy cross your path down there? Yeah, but you know I used to get old Betsy from the same guy who I got everything else from. But here's where everything differs for me when i think back to the old betsy that he was getting me i think of really dark purple almost black leaf weed oh interesting i wasn't that big a fan of it and it wasn't just once or twice it was a few times before he even quit bringing it when he would bring me his little briefcase full of samples and shit um because i i literally thought it was just a Nah, cut. But I I had to wonder since then, was I getting the real but why would he get, you know all this other legit shit and not Betsy? Yeah. Thing turned out to when I had to start going other places when I got P, when I got, you know, hogs, when I got any of that, it was the same thing that he used to get me. Uh but then I see old Betsy plants growing that are green all the way through and yeah being described is not what I so I, I don't know maybe like he he got mad he had more than one connect you know he there was only one connect that he got madness from so yeah. maybe he had the dude that he went to get old Betsy from so no, I don't know I was formed as to what genuine old Betsy was I don't think I had the real deal um how about blueberry hogs breath remember when that came around at all I remember the, you know, the, the name. Yeah, yeah. But I don't know that I ever got any of that. Once I, once I, see, I got here in 99 and I wasn't growing right away, but I was growing again by 2001, 2002. By then, yeah. I was no longer, you know, buying the, I was growing enough to keep myself going year round. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that was. I just remember when that finally got released and he let it out. Like you could throw a rock and hit it. Like it was in every fucking grow room of every fucking kid in San Diego for a while. Yeah, yeah. I kept my grow secret from. Well, is that good? For the first two years I was growing in San Diego, I used to. Uh, I used to use. I used to rent apartments, and they had to have a walk-in closet, and then I would just basically take about 80% of the closet and then build out of styrofoam a wall oh, that yeah. I could just come the door into. Uh, got pretty good at that too. We ended up, it, it was kind of cool to build rooms out of styrofoam, small rooms. Oh yeah. But we got to the point where we built, it had 12 foot ceilings in this building and we built a, 16 by 12 by 12 grow room. Two of the four walls were just built out of completely out of styrofoam duct tape and spray epoxy. Yeah. About four inches thick. Anyway, That's the way, way to do it. That's the way to do it. Will you leave the ventilation system on overnight and suck in the walls or blow the walls out? Then you just call in a coked out Russian to frame it in for you and do it right. <laughs> I appreciate the uh the tip on that book that you told me to get too, the the Afghani one. Do what was it called? Didn't it? Yeah, what was it called? Do you remember? I'd have to go into my now, I'll have my to answer. look. It, it's a really killer book though. It's, it's really well done. Afghanistan, the kingdom of cannabis. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. 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 I've it's very similar to uh, Cherniak's style. Yeah, yeah. Telling the story as it, you know, as it happened. I'll tell you what, yeah, you need to do, people need to do more episodes on hash, on hashish. 
uh, because it's the, there's no blueprint, you know, and, and for a couple of years, I was going through your book stash and explaining what I was looking for. I wanted the basic blueprint. I wanted to, okay, this is where you start when you make cash. And this is what you can expect. And this is what you should do. And you can do that with growing flowers. You can do that with living soil. You can get that information on any aspect of growing. But for but for making dry sift hash, it's just not out there. And I couldn't understand uh, why it wasn't out there. Why isn't there a book? This is how you make dry sift hash. And now now I understand because it's it's different every single time, man. It's yeah. it's such fluid art that is done so many different ways with the same basic tools uh yeah i think people need to start talking about hashish more concentrates in general but specifically dry stuff yeah. I, yeah. I think yeah. yeah you've done some beautiful dry stuff stuff that i've seen i appreciate that a lot i really don't <laughs> like smoking just flour anymore you know, as obsessed as I've been with growing for my entire adult life back into my teens, uh, it, it is now second seat. It's just a step to getting to making hash. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's like, it, it was the penultimate. It was the destination for the first 40 years of my experience with cannabis. Uh, and now it's just third to the last step yeah yeah well you do a damn good job at job at it i'm really happy i i'm the fuck you i'm the hashtag you know fuck your legal weed guy yeah honestly i'm i'm happy for everybody who's who's getting it going on i'm happy that not nearly as many people are going to jail for it uh i think it's fucking great and if i were 25 years younger i'd be you know i'd be all over it but For sure it's so nice to be this age where see for example you don't always want to see behind the curtain right yeah you know I grew up a fanatic of harley davidson motorcycles loved harley loved the lifestyle loved the fictionalized lifestyle loved the true lifestyle loved riding all that stuff. I went to work for Harley Davidson and I still love it, but now I know it's, it's a job. It, yeah. It's a lot of jobs for a lot of people to put that image that I fell in love with. And it's so in love with. that takes a lot of work to keep yeah. them. And once you see that, it just takes a little edge of the magic off. You know what I mean? Just That's a very little true. bit. It actually opens up a whole new world, you know, uh, yeah. just well, but with legal weed, I'm actually kind of glad that I'm kind of, you know, missed that being the focus of my professional drive because now I get to keep the magic and I get yeah. to, you know, tell people to go fuck themselves and, you know, call people sellouts. <laughs> happy for everybody else uh, <laughs> this i'm not going to take part in anything where tax money goes to law enforcement you know what yeah i, mean? it, I feel you there probably, that's probably a whole nother episode in and of it, <laughs> yeah mean uh, you can rant about that shit for hours i'm happy with what's going on see at this point i'm just talking i'm not even thinking of the podcast i'm yeah um now we love that yeah, here in New Mexico, I don't even know the law. I literally made myself be ignorant of the laws. I don't know if any of the tax goes to law enforcement out here, and I don't want to fucking know. Yeah. Because that it just ruins it for me. Talk it's, about losing the magic, bro. Yeah, yeah. No shit. <laughs> I, I look into the, they got some really cool shit in, in the legal scene out here. And I'll tell you what, since it went recreational a couple years ago, the quality has skyrocketed. Which doesn't take much. All you need is a Cali pipeline for cuts, right. you know. Yeah, right. It's skyrocket. But I haven't partaken at all. I've never been in a dispensary out here. 
in three and a half years, I've never shopped. Um, I did look into, they have macro licenses here. Oh, do they? For, it maxes out, I think, at a few hundred plants. Yeah. Somebody who is at least zoned right can, can make an honest mom and pop shop attempt uh, here in New Mexico, especially in southern New Mexico, where everything, the focus is always on mom and pop, you know, yeah. small down here from food to art to, you know, it's a great place. They could develop a really cool. They could develop a really cool cannabis scene here in Las Cruces. They'd have to chew. One thing, another, another thing that just I'm zero tolerance on. And for personal grow, I can have 12 plants here, right? Yeah. If I have six in flower, I'm limited to six in veg. Yeah. You want to you want to set the number of what I can flower at six and charge me a tax, essentially. For anything above that, because you'd have to get a macro a micro license. Yeah. I'm fine, but don't fucking tell me how many goddamn plants I can have in veg. You yeah, know what right? I mean? What's that doing? The fact that somebody has ten plants instead of six, while well, they got six in flower, is not going to influence anybody who isn't going to break your law anyway to break that law. They'll exactly. just you're not creating criminals by letting them have 30 or 40 veg plants while they search through a batch of seeds you know what i mean yeah like this is so small town uh do it yourself mom and pop restaurants mom and pop everything that if they would let people you know do those searches find those phenos develop the, the habits you need, the experience you need to find special cuts out of seeds, you know, you let the people do that, you're going to organically grow a nice cannabis seed. Oh, yeah. Rather, sure. rather than the cats who move from Cal, I'm not talking shit, but there's people who move from California out here to New Mexico. Oh, absolutely. And he, you know, even if New Mexico did very well to make sure it was New Mexico residents getting the licenses, a lot of those licenses got somebody in the grow room, you know, from Cali running the whole fucking show. Yep. Um, again, no, not disrespecting anybody. It's a good business move on everybody's part. Um, but now you're letting those people dictate what the local scene grows. Yeah. Las Cruces is kind of an island on land you know you got el paso over a very unfriendly state line you know? <laughs> yeah and then you got a whole lot of desert for a whole lot of miles a whole lot of indian reservation and then you got northern New mexico a long way away so i really wish they would do away with the plant count laws as far as vegetative yeah, that doesn't really make a lot of sense, especially considering you, like you're not producing any drug content with the veg plants. So who gives a fuck about the veg plants? Yeah, no the sense. people who grow more than six without a license are going to grow more than six without a license. Absolutely. Yeah, right? It's common sense. Yeah. So if that was changed, I'd be a happy cat. I was going to get a micro license. One of the things you have to do is present them with a business plan. And I, yeah. you know, they don't give you the information over the phone, but I annoyed one of the clerks who works there so much. She says, okay, pitch me your business plan and I'll tell you what I think. I said, well, my business plan. She goes, how much money are you going to make in the first year? I'm like, none. <laughs> She's like, what do you mean? I said, I just want to pop seeds, man, and yeah. be able to have, sort through them. That's all I want to do. I don't want to sell cuts of it. I don't want to do any of that shit. And if I did, I'd do it and I wouldn't fucking tell you anyway. Yeah, right. Go, right? <laughs> um, but she's like, you know, that's just not, you know, your business plan will have to be approved. So you will have to come up with something. And that's when I said, okay, thanks. For and I was like, fuck it. I'm not looking any further. Business plan, bro. We're stoners. Get the fuck out of here with the business plan. Well, you know, it's it's not a bad idea. You gotta force people to 
to consider these things. There, there's also, we live in a water rights state. So mm -hmm. there's, you know, I don't have any water rights, although I do have a well on, on my lot that's no longer in use, but it qualifies me to buy water rights. But I'm like, look, I'm not going to need any water rights because I'm not going to be growing enough where I'm just not going to go fill my seven gallon jugs of with RO water yeah. down at Mr. Trees in the grocery store parking lot. It tests less than a hundred parts per million. So yeah. She's like, your business plan just doesn't make any sense. I'm like, I'm sorry, I just want to pop seed, man. Bye. Yeah, business plan. I love that. Yeah, you need a business plan. I want to make no money. How about that? <laughs> you can go over well. So I don't know. But I do appreciate some of the things they're they're doing here in New Mexico. And it being a, a low populated state, it allows them to kind of uh push towards grassroots a little bit. I think it's yeah. a good thing. Right? That makes sense. But I'm sure they still fund the pigs somehow. So fuck them. Uh, you know they do. They always do. Always find a way to do it. You gotta get your cut or it ain't happening. Yeah, you, who's gonna protect you, bro? Who's gonna keep you safe? They don't get their cut. Yeah. Right? But other than that, you know, it'd be this would be a great place, especially for Afghani for for Asian. Oh yeah, uh, and races, man. 120 degrees, but it's got plenty of humidity in late summer. You know, it's you look at pictures in those books, like that book you just got, and yeah, it looks a lot like my backyard. <laughs> yeah, it looks a lot like Bakersfield too, bro. Like it, it's very similar. Yeah. High temps, love it. Yeah, it also burns up all the turps, though, I'd imagine. No, no. It, uh, what did I grow? I grew three skank dog, or I grew three skunk dog S1s. Okay. And three uh, OG of some sort hit with orange juice bud from OB Soul, obsolete. Mm -hmm. Um, like I said, they stunk. They stuck the entire, everybody knew somebody was growing pot somewhere. Oh, I bet. Everybody within a mile radius. <laughs> and, and I'm zoned, kind of downtown. I'm zoned commercial residential here. Yeah. Uh, and I've got enough room. And I got a big ass empty casita, one room casita out back. So I had, I had the potential to do a cannabis business if I wanted to. But like I said, you know, having kind of missed that window, uh, it allows me to just enjoy being a small town, small time. Yeah. Well, do you have any shout outs you want to do? No. Nope. Uh, no. As, oh, you mean like for like, like, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any shout outs you want to do for the closing out? Just say, hey. Give a shout out to my boy XYZ. You know, everybody knows who everybody knows who I'm with. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's that's right, man. I want to make them feel special. If they're friends of mine, <laughs> really give them a shout out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what's up. And uh, like we said, you can find your seeds at Seed Trip, uh, Seed Trip Seeds at RiotSeeds.com in the feminized section, and uh, they'll be available until they're sold out. So be sure to grab them. And with that, we want to say thank you. Thank you for joining the show, Rob. And we'll have you back soon. Have fun. Thanks, Rob. Like we said, your seeds are available at, uh, at riotseeds.com. Is there anywhere else? No. No, that's it? There's not enough. I mean, I'm keeping yeah. what I got. Yeah. Uh, people need to jump on those. I suppose we probably... I was really high when we discussed that. I hope I got across, <laughs> you know. What, I think we did a good Jeep. job. Did we? Yeah. Yeah, we did a good job on that. Yeah, grab those yeah, and that's it. Want to sit at the table with the syndicate? Check out our Patreon and our link tree or description below. Our merch site is officially live. 
We have all sorts of shirts, hoodies, and goodies to sort you out, and shipping is super fast, and most importantly, the quality is top-notch. I've been saving old designs for years for this purpose, so please check it out, syndicategear.com. We also have an underground syndicate discord where we get together and solve old strain history together daily. It's an amazing community of learning away from IG, and it's an amazing resource for old catalogs and knowledge. We hope you join our union of readers and growers. Come check it out.